Um, hi, my name is Geert Jan. I'm a member of the NetBeans team. And you may be in the wrong session because this isn't about anything other than Power Agent, which is a which is a, a um, which is an application that you get when you buy a exercise bicycle from a company called CycleOps. So you get your exercise bicycle from CycleOps. And you get some software, you install that software, and then you connect to your laptop from your exercise bicycle. And as you do your exercises, you can track what you're doing, and you can see what's been happening, and you can evaluate your results over periods of time. Now, of course, this um, application happens to be created on top of the main subject for today, but I'm showing you this because very often, People say that, um, that desktop applications are basically used in-house in the back office uh, somewhere. Um, but in fact, they're not. Um, there's a lot of applications out there that you can download straight off a website. Um, for example, if you go to docudesk.com, you'll get a, a PDF reader, a PDF editor, and PDF-related uh, functionality um, that you can download and, and buy from them. That is also based on the NetBeans platform. So there are, there are multiple <coughs> scenarios um, where uh, Java desktop applications are, 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 are just pure end-user uh, software. But beyond that, um, the, the, the Java desktop or the, the, the desktop at all um, is quite broad. So on the NetBeans platform homepage, you'll find a list of hundreds of applications um, in places where you might imagine them to be. Um, for example, um, air traffic control, defense-related applications, banks, um, oil and gas services, kind of scenarios where there has to be heavy processing of some kind, um, where there has to be um, offline usage because there isn't a network or the network is unstable or unreliable, where um, security is a large concern, such as in banking environments. In practically every uh, software development environment imaginable, um, you will find that there are um, desktop solutions. And without any plan for those desktop solutions to ever be migrated to the web. It's not that these, uh, that these pieces of software are there temporarily and kind of hoping to one day be web applications. This is where they are because I don't see air traffic control happening in a browser nor in a mobile phone. Um, so this, this domain is, is extremely large but um, underrepresented um, in, in conferences and the like. And, um, in this session, I want to introduce you to a simplified, but at the same time, very strong way of, um, very stable way in which you can create these applications. So um, on netbeans.org, there is a um, tab, a NetBeans platform. You get to, to platform.netbeans.org, which is the homepage, where you will find all the documentation, um, a list of what the features are, um, the showcase I just refer to, if you go to the documentation page, there are, there are literally hundreds of tutorials, and there are, there are books, and there's a, there's a lot of support for this um, approach that um, I'm going to talk about. And since throughout the conference, there have been some sessions on this topic already, um, focused on um, introductory slide-based uh, material, and as well as uh, demos and showcases. I thought um, in this particular one, it would be nice to to just code for an hour and see how far um, we can get and see what the result is. And so you can actually see the workflow of working with the NetBeans platform. And it, it makes a big difference seeing something for real rather than um, talking about it theoretically. So um, I'm just going to create an application. Uh, it will be an application on the, on the Java desktop. It will have a number of um, advantages um, that you see automatically. I'll name some up front, so we're going to be creating a modular um, application. Right now, the whole Jigsaw uh, project is um, years away from being uh, completed. Um, there is the NetBeans module system, there is the OSGI uh, module system. Um, either of those can be used in the context of a NetBeans platform application, which um, module system having a number of advantages that, that we can um, also refer to. You'll see a window system, you'll see a menu bar, a toolbar, you'll see many, you, basically anything that, that any application would normally have that is standard to any application should be provided out of the box um, um, by a framework in this uh, space. 
But before I begin, I'm pretty curious um, about who you are. So anyone who has ever created or begun creating a NetBeans platform application who has basically been at this point um, right before creating the first application, would you raise your hand? Okay, a couple of people. So I take it that for the majority, you've never actually seen the NetBeans platform in action before. Is that true? If yes? Okay, excellent. You're in the right place, after all. <laughs> so um, I'm going to create an application, and I, I imagine the scenario to be similar to this power agent. So there is some kind of external device that is plugged in in some way, and we want to read information from there, be it an exercise bicycle or a testing object or, a, or some kind of robot or whatever. We want to control that from, from an application. So I'm going to create this um, application, and I'll just call it Device Manager. So Device Manager, and I'll click Finish. So what I now have, even though it looks like I have uh, very little, is a the starting point of an application. And this application reuses um, modules that are part of the NetBeans IDE in which I'm creating this application. So I can see this. I can see that the NetBeans platform of this application is the NetBeans IDE that I am using to create it. Normally, what you would have at the very start of your development work, you would download um, NetBeans platform. So that is a distribution of NetBeans IDE without the IDE. And that distribution would be a zip file containing a bunch of jars that constitute the NetBeans platform. So a very small subset of what NetBeans IDE is. You would check that into your own repository, and then you would register that download, that zip file, into NetBeans IDE. And then when you create your new application, you would um, set that platform that you have downloaded as the basis of the application you're going to create. That is the assuming that you're starting from scratch. It's possible that you want to create your own application on top of, an, of another existing application. So for example, there's a farm management system that's been referred to a couple of times in the conference and that won the Duke's Choice Award. There's a NATO defense application. You could register those applications inside NetBeans IDE. And then when you create your own application, point to that application that already exists and have that as the basis and then build your application on top of that. So the, the NetBeans platform is, is modular, and um, any application that exists on the NetBeans platform is potentially the starting point for your own application. In this case, um, we have NetBeans IDE, which um, is what I'm using to create this application. But within that, one, uh, there's one checkbox in this um, long list of possible um, um, clusters of modules that I can use. There's one checkbox, and that is set on the platform. And you can see here that there are a number of checkboxes, and each checkbox is next to a jar file. These are jar files from NetBeans IDE, but underneath NetBeans IDE in the NetBeans platform. So for example, what we have is a window system. So there's a jar in the NetBeans platform that provides a window system. So we don't need to create um, docking, a docking framework. There's also a jar that provides an action system. Um, so in the um, action system, we will in the actions jar, you will find the menu bar and the toolbar. Um, we will also see that we're going to have the possibility to install plugins into our application because I've selected those additional jars. Um, there's a dialogues API, so we have access to standardized dialogues. We won't have to create our own dialogues but reuse existing ones. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, we have a mechanism for communicating between modules called Lookup. So there's a whole bunch of standardized um, functionality that we already have available. So I'm just going to run this application right now. And it starts up. And we can see the progress down here. Right now, what I'm creating is an Ant-based NetBeans platform application. I could be creating a Maven-based NetBeans platform application. And there are Maven archetypes for this. So you could just go to the command line type the Maven command for the archetypes, get the archetypes, open them into any IDE you like. So the point is that there is no necessary connection between the NetBeans platform and the NetBeans IDE, except that you could see NetBeans IDE as the reference implementation of the NetBeans platform. And if you use NetBeans IDE to create your NetBeans platform-based applications, you will find yourself looking at NetBeans IDE in a different way. You'll be thinking, hey, that's interesting. There's this drop-down button here. 
So there's a button in the toolbar of NetBeans IDE which I can click on and then the menu items appear. Where is that in standard Java? Nowhere. It's somewhere in NetBeans IDE. So then you can look in the source code of NetBeans IDE and find that source code, or hopefully you find an API that NetBeans IDE exposes so that you can have those drop-down buttons. So then you begin looking at NetBeans IDE as, as a container providing examples of things that you could be doing in your own application. But the application is started up. I'll make it a bit smaller, and I'll close it, and I'll run it again. And what you should notice is that the application starts up in the same location and in the same size as where I left it. I'll open a properties window, an output window. So these are uh, predefined windows that the, um, that the NetBeans platform provides. And there are APIs for these windows. So I can plug into the output window. I can write, instead of writing to, st to standard out, I can write to the out of the output window. I can display properties in the properties window. Um, there is an exit menu item, there is an about box. Um, I can customize this, remove the splash screen um, that is shown here. Um, there's an options window. So as you can see, we can almost sell this application already to our customers. It's almost there. <laughs> it's not far. <laughs> not really, right? But at least the, the, basis, the basis is there. The basis for any um, uh, software now we're talking software, we're not talking web apps, we're not, talk, not talking mobile, we're not talking tablets, we're talking software on the desktop. So all the basics are there. How and big is the, um, how big is that? Okay. Um, indeed, the, the point should be made that if you're creating some kind of trivial, small, or even medium-sized application, this potentially is not the way that you would go. This is really a system for, for large, larger applications. Um, because, yes, there are a number of jars that are included, but because it is a modular system, you can choose which jars you want to include. And the, the minimum jars that you include are only six jars, and they're quite small. And none of those six jars that are mandatory contain GUI components. So that provides a lot of interesting possibilities because then you could create potentially, which I mean it would be a lot of work, you could create a JavaFX based as opposed to Swing based uh, framework on top of that container or a Scala based and there are open source projects around that. Even server side things. Even server -side things. Um, I, I have a command line tool, um, very useful, where I can type something on the command line, a, a phrase from Shakespeare, press enter, and then a web service returns where that comes from and the, and the speaker and the play and, the, and whatever. And I can add additional modules onto the class path and then search in other places as well um, because it's a modular system. Are you going to talk about data, what the, the smallest yes. from data Yes, we can, we can do it immediately. So yes. So here is the NetBeans platform. So this is um, each of those clusters you saw are actually folders on disk. So here is platform and here are the modules. And the, the, the core, so is the, is one of them is called core. Um, another one is, um, let's see. Um, well, here's this one here. Yeah, well, not just that core one. Um, there's core and there's file system. Uh, well, I prefer this view on things. Um, you could remove everything and be left with a bootstrap is one, core is another, not the other cores, just that particular core. Uh, startup is in this list. Uh, the file system, which means every single NetBeans platform application has a, has a file system in the same way as a, as a computer has a file system. So when you install modules into the NetBeans platform application, you're you're putting new folders and files into this virtual file system. And in that way, other parts of the application can find information. For example, the menu bar looks for a fixed um, folder in the file system. So there's a folder called menu. And all the action listeners from, from plain Java that you have registered in that menu folder are automatically loaded into the menu bar at startup of the application. And all the action listeners you've registered into the toolbars folder are automatically loaded into the toolbar. So um, anyway, there's um, five or six small jars that are the, the core, and you could create server-based applications. This is not necessarily a client solution. But most typically it is a client solution because normally when people see that um, without any coding, 
they can undock windows and move them onto other screens, then that is mainly what they want to do. Um, so if you're creating air traffic control or stock trading um, type applications, this is what you need. You need a, a GUI that is much more flexible out of the box than plain Swing lets you be or plain Java FX lets you be. Only Eclipse Rich Client Platform. Um, um, on, there are competing products on, on individual parts. For example, you could look at other Windows systems. But as, in terms of the entire application framework, you only have Eclipse RCP on NetBeans platform in terms of all the things that it provides. And there the core difference is SWT versus Swing. And there are details. In, in some cases, this is better. In other cases, this is better. But when it comes right down to it, um, Eclipse RCP is tied to SWT while NetBeans platform is, is to Swing which lets you integrate JavaFX much more easily than it does in SWT. Okay, so let's actually create um, more of this application. Um, so we have this device manager as a starting point. Um, what we want to create is a manager for devices. So we'll create a first module. Um, I'll call this device domain. And this is the nice thing also about a modular system. Um, so we say um, org. Um, device domain, because we imagine we have a website, device.org. Um, that's basically the um, uh, unique name for our, for our module, which also turns out to be the main package of the module. Um, the nice thing about a modular system is that it lets you organize your code into logical places. And we now have one module inside of which all of our domain classes will be found. We'll have another module that will provide a specific feature. So each module in the application will provide a different feature to the end user, which will then enable us to um, distribute the parts of the application that are relevant for specific users. So in the case of NetBeans IDE, we have a PHP distribution, which contains just the modules that are part of the PHP story, and a Java distribution, a Groovy distribution. And that kind of approach you can take for your own software. So you're creating farm management software. Some of the users are, are farmers, others are managers, others are, they're all doing different things. They don't want this massive application, they want a small application providing just the features that they need. And, and that is one of the features that a, a module system gives you. Yes, absolutely. So I create, as a starting point, a new class, and I call it device. Okay, so device, um, I'll try and make this a bit bigger, has a string type and maybe int um, uh, ID. We create some getters and setters for this. And we create a constructor. Okay, that's enough for the moment. We have our device object ready. And this is another nice thing about the, the NetBeans platform and modular development. You can start off with your domain object and build your entire application around that, exactly as I'm doing it now. So we have our um, device object inside a specific module. We'll create a first new module that will provide a, a explorer window where a long list of devices will be shown that are connected into our port. So we'll have a window over here that lists all our devices, whatever they are. And when double-clicked on them, another window will open showing some kind of graph or a chart or something about the current device. So I create a new module called Device Viewer. And this also shows that, because often when someone is introduced to the fact that, okay, now you're working in a modular system, they think, oh no, so now I have to use this whole module thing. The, the point is that the module thing is really helpful. It's, it's, it's useful in, in what you're doing. It's not something that you have to adopt because you're, you're going down this route. And also, if you, w if you want to, you could have one single module where you put all of your code. Uh, that's completely possible, but not, not really making best use of the features available. So org.device.viewer. So here it is. So now we have two modules, plus all the modules we already had from the NetBeans platform. And let's, inside this um, new module, create a window that will be displayed on the left-hand side. Um, so a window just like this one, in fact, in NetBeans IDE. So again, you can, you, by looking at NetBeans IDE and all the other applications, 
um, you can really learn a lot about the kinds of things that you might want to do in your own applications, see how others have done it. And many of these applications are open source. So you can download the sources, and there's a mailing list, and everyone in the world working on these applications is on the mailing list somewhere. So there's a lot of support and help that you get, all for free. Um, so right-click on the package, and there are a number of templates here, which is the reason why NetBeans IDE is really useful for doing this kind of work, especially when you get, first get started with it. But once you've created your basic artifacts, a new window, new menu item, these things, you could open your application into any other IDE if you are using Maven, because with a Maven-based application, you have a palm file on Eclipse and IntelliJ, and all the IDEs understand what to do with that palm file. So I'll say I want a new window, but I could create a new action, which can be displayed in a menu bar or in a toolbar, a new wizard, so step, uh, m multiple dialogues with predefined uh, buttons. We can extend the options window. We can create um, a Java help set. There was a question in a previous session. There's a template that we'll use later on to, um, to create Java help sets. We can change how windows are laid out. There's a lot of predefined support. Um, so in a way, NetBeans IDE is the SDK for the NetBeans platform, even though it isn't mandatory to use, to use that. So we'll choose a position. So you should imagine the application frame as having a number of fixed positions. The um, vertical on the left is called explorer position. Um, uh, the horizontal along the bottom is the output position. So the, the, they're all fixed positions um, within the application frame. And you can put, uh, you can register windows into the file system, into the folders that relate to those particular positions. So in the same way as when the application starts up, the menu bar looks in the menu folder and the toolbar looks in the, tool, in the toolbar folder, the window system looks in the window folder and finds all the windows there registered in folders that relate to the um, areas where they should be displayed. So we say explorer position, and it should open when the application starts, and we say this is called device viewer. Click finish. And what is now created is <coughs> something that is very similar to a J panel, but it's a different class. It is a top component, and it has a number of annotations at the top, uh, which is because we are moving more and more towards annotation-based registration. Um, ultimately, the file system, uh, a module contributes to the file system by providing an XML file, so each module can have one of these, that registers the GUI features, such as the windows, such as the menu items, into the virtual file system. Now, you could have fun typing those things in XML by hand. But first of all, it's not fun, um, especially if you're a Java developer, you would prefer to do everything in Java. So therefore, we have annotations which, when the module is compiled, result in those XML entries being generated by the annotation processor from those annotations that we have to find at the top of the class. So we see here, for example, because of the entries we filled out, we have um, a mode attribute for this top component registration annotation um, set to Explorer, which means this top component will be registered inside the file system in a folder within the Windows folder, and that folder will be called Explorer. When the Windows system looks inside the Windows folder, it will find this window and display it in the Explorer position. It will open at startup, and automatically a menu item will be created for it because more than likely, if you have a window, you want to let the user open it once they've closed it. So automatically, a menu item is created for opening that window. Um, there's also a nice um, feature that relates to these annotations, which is these messages. So normally, you will have, or what can happen is that you have um, texts and display texts and whatever inside your Java classes somewhere, which isn't very nice for translation purposes, for localization. Um, so then your next step is, OK, I'll put all of my display texts into a properties file, which is separate from my Java classes. But then the problem is you have a properties file with a long list of strings, um, and you don't know what classes they relate to anymore. So the solution here is that the NetBeans platform gives you a messages annotation, which lets you create um, uh, keys and values, and at compile time, this is turned into a properties file. So I can see in here where those strings belong to, because they're within the class where I've created them. So they are not in, inside a long list of, property uh, of, of keys and values in a properties file that I've created, but they'll be created automatically at compile time. So there's a lot of support via annotations, and we really like the annotation-based approach because we really like Java. So this is, this is a, a trend that's going to continue a lot. Each new release of NetBeans comes with new annotations. What are the same methods 
then you will get an error. You, 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 there, there's, a, there's a check that's done. So if another class already has this key, and I type this key in here, then there will be an, an, an error mark, and I won't be able to compile this, um, or co compilation will fail of this class. What if I want to add another language? If you want to add another language, you'll create another properties file where that translation and will be done. The yes, then you have to go to the properties file. This is for your base language, exactly. Okay, so here we are, um, slight diversion from um, creating the window, but interesting nonetheless, I hope. Application starts up again. We see now we have another window, and this window automatically behaves in the same way as all the other windows. We can undock it and move it out, and we can um, dock it again, and a new feature that's come in recently is if we had multiple different windows here, we could um, float the whole group of windows which is something that um, air traffic control um, companies and uh, stock trading organizations have asked for. That they want to be able to undock multiple windows that relate to each other at the same time. So it might seem like a small feature, but it's, it's been a blocker for many organizations. And the reason why it's been implemented now is because JDeveloper had that feature. So JDeveloper has this feature, and now JDeveloper is on the NetBeans platform. The JDeveloper team said, okay, we agree with moving our framework to the NetBeans platform if the features that we had before are going to be supported once we've actually moved there. So we had to make a bunch of changes to the NetBeans window system to support JDeveloper being ported to the NetBeans platform. That's so already done. That's already done. The current release of JDeveloper that you download, when you, you will have a new folder called NetBeans. When you start up JDeveloper, you'll see NetBeans messages in the output window or in the in, in system out. You'll see properties um, that are NetBeans specific. In future releases, um, so you, you will not see anything in the GUI yet, but in future releases, you'll see the NetBeans window system, and gradually you'll see more features that, that resemble NetBeans. And this makes it possible for us to share features between each other. There's never going to be a point where we merge because we have completely different audiences. NetBeans is really the, the IDE for the open source community, while JDeveloper is the IDE for, for Oracle customers with ADF and WebLogic and their specific requirements. But it doesn't make sense for us to have two teams solving the same problems for two different products. So when it comes to the Windows system and to the project system and to those kinds of common concerns, we want to be able to reuse as much as possible from, from the places where it makes sense. So it, it, it is also conceivable that NetBeans will have pieces of, of JDeveloper, like NetBeans has a pretty poor XML editor, and JDeveloper has a pretty nice one. So those kinds of um, options become possible now that we're on the same basis. Anyway, a again, a slight diversion. Um, let's continue. And we have now a window, and we would like to display a list of devices in here. Now, NetBeans has a very nice solution for, um, for complex swing components. If you're creating a complex swing components like a J list, a J table, a J tree, and, and components like that, you find, and it's completely standard if you're a swing developer, you don't even think about this anymore, but each of those swing components has their own model clocks. So there's an abstract list model for, for J list, there's a tree whatever model for tree, and there's a table whatever for table. Wouldn't it be nice if there was one single model that you would define once? that all of those different swing components could understand and do something with. So in the NetBeans platform, the solution for that is called Node. So there is, I'm going to add a new dependency in my application on Node's API. And this gives me a wrapper around a business object, such as we have right now, uh, called Device. So I'll create a new Java class, and I'll call it Device Node. So here it is. And it's, there are different node subclasses, but we'll take the, the simplest and most powerful one as a starting point, bean node. Okay, so in here I create a constructor, and I can see that there are three different kinds of constructors. Um, the plain constructor that accepts some object, which in this case is going to be device. A, a second constructor which optionally lets us provide children of the device. So we can imagine device and sub-device and sub-sub-device and, and so on. So those children are passed into the constructor of the node. And then as a third constructor, we can pass in what is called a lookup, which is a whole topic on its own, but is a, a messaging strategy, a loosely coupled mechanism built into the NetBeans platform. So for example, if we want to enable the save button for our node, we will put uh, some object into this um, lookup mechanism, so into the registry of the node, and then the save action will be listening for that object and will become enabled when that object is published. So there's kind of a publish-subscribe mechanism that we, can, that we can look at if there's time. But let's take the simplest one, 
and we want to not pass in the object, but you want to pass in the device. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Yes, sure. Um, we could. However, the problem, or as you'll see soon, not a problem, but a really good thing, is we cannot import the device object. So even so, we could think right now, okay, this is a bug in NetBeans. We can't get the import statement. So we can try and type it. But you see that we cannot find it. It's not there. And the reason is that each module in the NetBeans platform has its own class loader. By definition, everything inside a module is hidden from all other modules. And the reason for this is to create a clean architecture. So only something can be reused if the author of a module explicitly decides, OK, I'm now ready for others to reuse my code. Preventing the situation where some new person on your team decides, hey, that's a cool utility method. I'm going to reuse that utility method over here. And use it, start, start depending on it, you change the utility method somewhere, and completely destroy the application and cause problems. So only once something has been explicitly exposed within a module to the rest of the application can other parts of the application use that code. So I need to go in here so I can see in this project metadata, which feeds into the manifest file. So when the module is built, the information inside this project XML file is put into the manifest file. And I can see right now that I have no public packages. So I go into the project property, so another place where NetBeans IDE is useful to use in this context. And I say, so ultimately, I'll have a long list of packages here. And for each package, I need to decide explicitly to say, this is public. OK, so now you can see we have public packages. When the module is compiled, this information will be found inside the manifest file. So the, the manifest file of modules in the NetBeans platform have specific keys. So there, there, there are keys that are specific to the NetBeans platform, in the same way as OSGI has keys in the manifest file that are specific to OSGI. So now that we have done this, we can depend on that other module. Yes, it's, it's a bi-directional relationship, always. So one side needs to expose one or more packages. The other side needs to say, I depend on that. So it's, it's a very strict system. And it really helps in creating a clean, um, clean code, clean architecture. So now we can get the import statement. OK, so we've received this beam. And we say, um, for example, set display name. There's a lot of different setters. The display name, the icon. So this node class, in fact, is a GUI wrapper around our object. Because in our object, we have a type and an ID. We don't in there have an icon and a display name. Those are things that are not of concern for domain objects. But this class is of concern in giving a GUI wrapper around that object, a display name and icon, such as all of the things you see here. You can see an icon, display name. When I right click on a node, I can see actions. Um, there are properties for, for a node. So when I have the properties window open, I can see the properties displayed um, on the right hand side. So there's a lot of features that a node has. So with this knowledge, you can look at NetBeans IDE in a new way and, and see everything that I am moving up and down here. These are all nodes, and they are found in a NetBeans-specific Sphinx component that knows what a node is and can display it, as we're going to do soon. So I'll say set display name, and from the bean, I will get uh, bean dot get uh, type, for example. Um, and I could set a short description, which is the tooltip. Um, I can set actions, but we'll just leave it, leave it here for the moment. So close that. I have a device node. I have a device, and I have a window. So now I want to display this, um, this node inside my window. And the way this is done is via special swing components that the NetBeans platform has on top of the standard swing components. So where there is a JList, NetBeans platform has a, has a list where there's a tree. You know, there's equivalents for each. You can continue using your existing ones. So a typical migration path is to um, to use the window system, to use these, these windows, um, which are called top components, because they extend the top component class. So typically, you'll move your JList, your JTrees, your, your JTables directly into these, um, into these window classes. Just copy and paste them in. Just say add in here, and you have your, you have your JList, your whatever. But a next stage of porting would be to think about the possibility of using the NetBeans platform swing components, because they provide some additional features, as we're going to see now. So first of all, I will add a new dependency on the module providing those, um, those swing components. And here it is. And one of those swing components is called bean tree view. Um, so here is bean tree view. Oh, sorry, bean tree view. And this will be device viewer 
equals new bin tree view. And we will add it to the um, top component, device viewer, and we'll put it um, to border layout center. And set the layout to new border layout. Okay, so let's run the application and see where we are. Is it still running? Yes. Okay, run the application again. There's also actually a nice plugin for NetBeans which lets you not need to restart the application. You can just leave it running and reload your module into the running application and really treat it like a server. So um, here we had now have the starting point of a tree view that's going to have a long list of, of our nodes. What we would now do in standard swing, we would now say device viewer, set model, and then somehow, um, and then here we have, we have our model, which is a device node. So here we would say new device node, probably, something like this. This would be the, the, the standard swing way of doing things. But the NetBeans platform has a very nice mechanism for this. It uses an MVC approach, which means that you do not attach your model to your view. Instead, you attach your model to the controller. And here is our controller. It's called, uh, the class is called Explorer Manager. And this will let our node be detached from our view and very easy, easily exchangeable. The component and the controller at the same time. It is just a controller. It is not a component. You will see this. It is not going to be a top component in the way that we end up with it. Um, okay. So we return it. Return the Explorer Manager. And here it is. And now that we have the Explorer Manager, we will um, instantiate it. And so instead of this line of code, we are going to say instead set read context, which is the same as set uh, model in standard swing. And here we would now refer to our model. However, we don't want one single device node. We want to have as many devices displayed in our tree as there are connected to our, um, to our connection. So what we really would want to have is some kind of factory class that will connect to our device, um, load up all the information and display it. So for that, we have a nice class called child factory. So device child factory. And this child factory exists to create um, device nodes in this case. So it extends child factory, and it has some very nice built-in functionality that we're going to see. So here we go. Um, here it is. We have one method um, predefined in here, which means once we initialize device child factory, automatically this method will be called. And this method is automatically run on a background thread. And therefore, this is where you make your connection to your data source, be it a database, web service, whatever it is. Um, you will automatically see a weight a symbol appearing, an, an hourglass. So all of that kind of handling will be done for you. And you will also not um, see your, your UI not being responsive. Your, your UI will be responsive while this connection is made. And until um, uh, true is returned here, um, your entire application will be as performant as before. So what we have here, so we'll just simulate a couple of these. Um, so I'll add to the list. Um, a new, a new device. So here's a new device. Uh, it has an ID, so one, two, three, and a type uh, blue, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, four, five, six, or some other number, green. So here we have two devices, and now when true is returned, whatever is found inside of that list is used to create nodes. And for that we have a method, um, override method, uh, create node for key. So here it is create node for key, and this is where we return our device node. So device node, node equals new device node key. Uh, let's get the inputs, get the uh, try catch block. So here's the node, device node, node, and return the node. Okay, so we have, we started with a device object, plain normal Java object. We created a device node to give it a display name. And now we have a top component which will display a bean tree view. The bean tree view will display 
whatever the Explorer Manager tells it to display. Because what happens at runtime, so the application is, is deployed, the bean tree view is put into the top component, and it asks its parent, in this case the top component, do you implement Explorer Manager provider? So built into the bean tree view and inside of all of the NetMuse Platform Swing components is a component hierarchy search for a parent that implements Explorer Manager. Once that parent is found, Get Explorer Manager is called. And here we have Get Explorer Manager. And so Explorer Manager is returned. And set on the Explorer Manager is a root context. So we'll create it, children.create, new device child factory, true. We need to create a new root node. And there we have it. OK, so the benefit of this is going to be clear in a second. So we run the application. Oh, it's already running. We run the application. And we see our two devices. OK, so now we think, OK, we don't just want to see a tree of our devices. We also want to see an, a list of icons. So there's another NetNews platform swing component called Icon View. So I choose Icon View, new Icon View, and not the standard one, but one that, OK, so here it is. And we put it into the east. Now, the cool thing is, both the bin tree view and the icon view are going to ask the parent, do you implement Explorer Manager? The parent will say yes to both. The same Explorer Manager will be returned, which handles what is currently selected. And, well, um, ah, thank you. And therefore, in both cases, we will see our devices displayed. Uh, still a typo. In both places, we will see our not only will we see our nodes, but you should also see when I select one node, it is in one of the viewers, it is also selected in the other of the viewers, which is a very important concern in large applications where you have multiple windows. When one item in one window is selected, you want the related item in the other window, wherever that is, to also be selected. So there is a, a selection system built into the NetMuse platform, which is really useful, and you can see it, the, this is a, a concern for large applications. If you're creating a small application with one window, probably the NetMuse platform is not something that you're going to be needing. But once that application becomes larger and you need to have multiple windows, you need to have um, multiple objects being displayed and objects being synchronized with each other, then this is a logical, um, logical way to go. Um, we can now publish this node. So you can see we have these nodes selected. We can publish into the registry of the top component. So there is a registry for a top component. There's a registry for a node. So if we make a change in NetBeans IDE, um, you can see that the Save button is now enabled because I've made a change. If I now press Save, um, the Save button is disabled. So this in itself is not magical behavior. But how it works is when a change is made, uh, a document listener that is inside the editor here publishes a particular object, an implementation of a certain interface. And the save action is listening for implementations of that interface. And it so happens that that particular interface has a, sub, has a method called save. And so when the save action listening for that particular um, implementation of, a partic of that particular interface discovers that one has been published, it calls that method without knowing what will happen on, when that method is invoked. But that method is defined by the editor component. So in this way, all of the different editor objects Anything that needs to be edited inside a NetBeans platform application can all integrate with the same save action. It is, of course, possible for each object that needs to be saved and edited and so on to provide their own save button, their own edit button, and whatever. But what you would like when you are creating an application like this is to let users create plugins. And when they create plugins, to integrate with the existing idioms of the application. So rather than creating their own save functionality, integrating with, with your existing save functionality. So a lot of what the NetMuse platform is about is finding these entry points into the existing features and publishing objects to enable and disable existing features and creating your own objects that are sensitive to, to certain other objects. So we're going to publish now into the uh, registry of, the, um, of this top component via a helper class, the Explorer Manager. And the Explorer Manager itself is the container of the nodes because you can see here we have set the node hierarchy on the Explorer Manager. 
So by doing this, by running the application now, we have published the nodes into the lookup of the top component, which means when I select a different node, the properties window is automatically updated because the properties window is listening for node objects. So now when I select a different node, a different node is published into the registry, into the lookup of this top component, which is because this window is selected, published into the context of the whole application. So there are a number of different, um, sometimes called registry, sometimes called lookup, sometimes called, called context. So these are the same um, concern. So you can see here we have an application, we have a window, um, we have multiple windows, but we always have one selected window, and we have a node. So there is the, the, the lookup of the node, the lookup of a window, the lookup of a selected window, and the lookup of the whole application. The properties window is listening to the lookup of the whole application, the application-wide lookup. When I have a particular window selected, whatever is in its lookup is merged with the lookup of the application. So whenever I select a node, what is in its lookup is merged with the lookup of the top component. Therefore, by selecting a node in this tree, I am actually pushing it, pushing the underlying object into its lookup and from there into the top component's lookup, and by selecting the top component into the application-wide lookup, which is where the properties window has indicated an interest in node objects. So this mechanism of, um, of publishing and subscribing and of messaging between modules is what keeps the application loosely coupled because the properties window knows nothing about my device viewer window. It only knows about the node object. Therefore, built into the NetBeans platform are a number of coding patterns and ideas and, and, and um, insights into um, large application development, into loose coupling that have, that have developed over the last 10 years or so, have all been integrated into the thinking behind these APIs and components and, and so on. Okay, so what we also see in the small application right now is a plugin manager, which means um, we can go to the plugin manager and install a plugin, and um, there are plugin portals all over the world which are comparable to what app stores are. So I can go to netbeans.org, and um, there's a plugins portal here. These are plugins for NetBeans IDE. But some of these plugins for NetBeans IDE are not editors or new tips and tricks for the Java editor, but are, are interesting other things, such as what I believe every application needs. Your application is not complete until you have Space Invaders um, integrated into it. I know this is not a very widely known um, rule, but um, you can download this plugin and install it directly into this, into this application and you have you know, a new feature. So potentially what you could do is find all the games that have been published um, as modules in different plugin portals, assemble them together, create a new update center which puts all those games in there. Probably you don't want to include the games in the, um, in the distribution that you make available to your users because it provides features that they may not want. So what you would do is you would um, register an update center, so an, an app store, um, inside this window here, so this is ultimately going to have a long list of these update centers. One of them could be the games update center, and then the user can choose which ones they want to use. Potentially, they would have to pay for them. So this, could, this is also the basis of a, um, of a business model around um, an application. Um, the, uh, there's a farm management application that's been um, um, referred to a lot on this conference also because of a Duke's Choice Award, but what they're doing is they get, they've discovered that farmers don't like buying software. So they give the software for free to the farmer. They start um, planning where to plant their potatoes and whatever. Um, they load maps into the application and they start liking it. And then they're told, um, if you want to buy a new fertilizer or whatever it is, um, you need to connect to your service provider. And um, you need to pay a couple of dollars per month to make that connection. And the service provider um, has had a plugin created for that particular service provider or has created it themselves, needs to pay a couple of dollars as well to be subscribed to the system to provide that service. So on the basis of that model, um, um, you know, all based on modularity and based on plugins and, and all out of the box. It's not something that you need to um, invent on your own. So um, let's see what else um, we could quickly show. Um, well, the options window is a centralized place where you want to uh, let the user configure your system. Um, each module that is, so that, so that the whole problem of a modular system is you don't know how many modules there are going to be as the curator of the application. So you want to leave extension points for others to contribute into it. Um, 
Therefore, um, when a new module is created, the module could include a, a panel that, that is registered again into the file system in a certain folder, and when the options window opens, it looks inside a folder looking for JPanels to, to add into itself. And that could be used to configure um, something that is provided by your module. Also the help, so there was a question about Java help in the previous session. Um, so Java help, the, 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 the worst thing about Java help is that there are a whole bunch of small XML files required um, that are quite painful to set up and that um, provide enough excuse for people to not provide documentation for their application. The unfortunate side effect of this um, being solved by a wizard in NetBeans is that you have no excuse to not provide documentation for your application. Mm -hmm. um, you can see here we have um, an HTML-based Java help system. So in NetBeans IDE, you can see this too, uh, help contents. So each of these sections that you see here come from different modules, or potentially, in this case, definitely. So when the uh, web service modules are uninstalled from NetBeans IDE, automatically this section of web service topics will also be um, uninstalled because they come from the same set of modules. Um, so if I run this application now, I've just completed that um, one Java help uh, wizard. Um, the application starts up, I go to help, uh, and now I have a menu item help contents for the first time, and I have this about device viewer as a first help topic. Each module uh, there'll be a device viewer, device editor, device analyzer could provide its own help topics, which would automatically integrate into here, into the search as well. Um, as, as a, so all of that is, um, is also solved. Um, so let's create another module. So this module will be used for editing devices. So we have a viewer, um, but we want to let the user do a bit more than that. Um, sorry, device editor. And potentially, we, we will have two different distributions. One, for viewing the devices, it's a completely reasonable use case. A uh, user wants to view what, what's, what the, what's on the connection, what devices are available, and um, um, they can have this for free, and then um, they need to pay a subscription fee or a license or something to have the, uh, access to the editor feature. Uh, add a new window, uh, editor, Open application start, uh, device editor. Okay. So here's the editor window. So let's say that, uh, so now we want to start listening to the lookup. So, so the, this, is the, this is the NetBeans word for registry or context. So this is a context listener. So implements lookup listener. What you would ideally like to do is to listen to the context for new device objects that are there. So we need to have a dependency on the device domain. Okay, so, so here is the, um, so this result changed method will be fired whenever there is a new object of our, of our type available in the lookup. So here we set that up. It, when the component opens, so each um, window, each uh, class of top component has a method open and close. So it's an actions global context. Um, listen to the lookup for device objects, device class. And from this, we get a result object. So lookup dot result for device, all devices in lookup. So here are all devices in lookup. This equals that. And then we need to start listening at lookup listener, and when the window closes, we want to stop listening. Yes, inside the lifecycle event. So when the component opens, when it closes, we will start and we will stop. So it, the, the, each module also has a life cycle, so you might want to do something when the module is loaded or un unloaded, each, each window has a life cycle. When it's closed, when it's open, when it's hidden, when it's shown, when it's activated. Um, okay, so we have here all devices in lookup, and so when there is a device in the lookup, this method will be called. So now we're going to say, we are only interested in the last one. So if uh, uh, all instances, uh, so if it isn't empty, we could, we could do something with all of them, but in this case, we are only interested in one of them. Um, so all devices in lookup, uh, all instances. 
instances, iterator. So we're just getting the last one as next. Um, device. And we want to make this. Not has next, but next, right? Okay, so here we have one device, and let's uh, go into our top component. And the nice thing as well is when you're designing GUIs, um, you have the wonderful Matisse GUI builder to help you. Um, so, type, so here's the type, um, so I just drag and drop. This is all Swing, um, and you might be wondering, okay, what about JavaFX? JavaFX can be integrated very easily into Swing. There's been sessions about that, uh, especially in the context of the NetBeans platform during this week. And there's also a tutorial that you can follow, and there's uh, stuff being written. The nice thing about JavaFX now, in JavaFX 2, is that you can do that. Uh, before, you, know, you would see a nice demo of JavaFX, and you'd say, yes, I want to use this, and you'd be told, oh, you have to rewrite your banking application to use JavaFX script. Now, you can gradually take the pieces that make sense. There's no one saying you, you, must, you must drop Swing and use only JavaFX. The, the reason why there's integration that's possible now is so that you can pick the pieces from JavaFX that make sense to you. Pick the web view, pick some of the nice JavaFX charts. Pick those pieces that make sense and keep your J labels and whatever um, because there's no immediate need to change those. Um, so we set the text to the device, uh, get type. Okay, so that's all we need to do. So this is the subscription side. So here we are listening for devices and displaying the current one in the lookup. Now on the other side, we need to publish. So right now, we are not actually publishing anything yet. Okay, we have five minutes left and it's, we're almost done. Um, device node, so we can say, so we're using the simplest constructor. We're gonna say um, children.leaf, so the devices will not have sub-devices, but the device is going to have um, a registry and the registry is gonna be populated by the device object. So we have now added our object into the lookup of the node. And when the node is selected, it's added to the lookup of the top component. And when the top component is selected, it's added to the lookup of the context. And the, the two of them now integrate completely with each other. So very small application, but showing all of the essential features. Not all really, um, there's, uh, we haven't looked at actions yet. Um, the nice thing is, um, if you want to, to create menu items, you never need to type again, menu um, item is new menu item, because instead there is a wizard for this, and either actions are always enabled or conditionally enabled. Let's say it's conditionally enabled. So enablement is a nightmare to set up um, normally. Um, so we'll say device here. Um, we'll put it into the file menu. Um, so it would be nice if I had a toolbar button, but I don't think I have an icon lying around. Um, we need to display some... Yeah, um, okay, so we're not going to do the toolbar, but you see the, you see the menu bar. Okay, next. Um, so this will be um, analyze device action. Analyze device, click finish. Now what you see here is a plain old action listener. This is not a special NetMeans platform class. This is a standard Java class, but it will also be registered into the file system in a special way. It's gonna be registered in there together with the icon that we've set, if you've set one, the display name. Um, also, it's going to be in the file menu. So we want it to be in the device menu. Okay, so now we've created a new folder in the menu folder, um, which will display um, uh, which will be displayed in the device menu. And the final bit of code, wait, show message, no, and we have the context immediately, which is very useful. So this is very clean code. We don't need to spend any time figuring out how to enable our, our um, action because at, comp at the time when the module is compiled, these annotations are turned into XML entries, and because we've said we've put this device context into the constructor of our class, because of that, um, the way that this uh, action listener is registered is in such a way that it maps to a conditionally enablement functionality in the NetBeans platform. So if I look in device, right now it is disabled because no device is selected. Now a device is selected and now it is enabled. 
I mean, and this was no coding at all. And that is a lot of work that you would normally need to do to achieve this. And it's all done via mapping from these um, annotations to XML. And internally, the XML is mapped to an, to an internal class that handles the enablement for you for that specific object that you have said. Um, so it, we're specifying for this object that action should be enabled. So there's a lot more, but these are the, the basic concepts. Um, the module system, the window system that you've seen, and the action system, this lookup mechanism for, for clean um, communication between the different windows. Um, there's, uh, I've very carefully left one minute for questions. Um, <laughs> so are there any questions? Yes, yes. So um, what you can do is you right click and you say package as NBMs. And don't leave yet because I have a gift for you. So if you're walking away now, you're not going to get the special uh, present. <laughs> um, OK. Um, in the build folder, once you've um, chosen that option, you'll find the, an updates XML file. Now, this is an XML file that lists all the modules that your update center is making available. So I can put this XML file on a server somewhere and then have it registered in my application, either pre-registered or let the user register it. And in here, you can see there's a distribution attribute. And the distribution attribute points to the place where the NBM file was found. So in this case, it's found in the same location as the file itself, but it could be in some subdirectory. There was another question. Um, how would you do automated GUI testing? Yes, automated GUI testing. Um, uh, the, the nice thing is that NetBeans IDE um, uses the NetBeans platform. So the NetBeans IDE engineers have solutions for that that were used for NetBeans IDE that they have made available um, more generally. So on the tutorial page, you'll find um, a test uh, tutorial. And there are modules that are uh, provided that um, are used for, uh, for GUI testing. Uh, sorry, I'm not finding the right location. Um, but if you go to the, to the um, NetBeans platform page, to all documentation, you will see a section on testing uh, somewhere. Uh, there, NetBeans platform test. And uh, other cool thing is, NetBeans, so this is kind of boring test, but what is interesting is gesture collection. Don't you want to know what your users are doing with your application? And NetBeans IDE engineers do want to know. So they've created an application uh, uh, support for that in NetBeans IDE, which is generally available. So you can log the clicks that people are, are making on your application and, and ask them either at some point in the process whether that information can be sent to you. And also there are charts. There's a whole charting, um, a, a web application that is used by NetBeans IDE, which is open source, with which you can integrate that logging information. And um, NetBeans IDE, if you want to see some interesting statistics, has um, NB statistics, um, uh, NB statistics, statistics.netbeans.org, which has a lot of cool information. Oh, OK, I'm not actually getting to the right place. Uh, NB statistics, NetBeans. Well, I'm not finding it. Anyway, there's a, there's a place there where you see lots of graphs, and you, you find out that a lot of people are doing cut and paste uh, programming. Because uh, you can see all the, all the actions that are being performed in the, uh, in the ID. OK. <laughs> So um, if you give me your business card, um, which will only be used by, by me, myself, personally, to tell you about um, upcoming courses and things like that, um, you will get, in return, a, a cheat sheet, which introduces you to everything. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in the course, please let me know immediately, and uh, we'll be in touch uh, soon. Thank you very much.